Hi, welcome to the June 14th meeting of the CNCF IoT Edge Working Group. Um, on the agenda today, but probably in the second half of this meeting, we have a discussion slated on this Edge Native Principles paper. Uh, the agenda is described as part three. And this is a supplemental or different paper from that first one we were working on uh, starting over a year ago, but addresses slightly different topics. When we get to that, I think uh, Brandon will be moderator. Uh, we're going to start that late because I think a few people who want to participate have conflicts until 30 minutes after the hour. Um, so as usual in this group, if we don't have agenda items, we um, open it up for birds of a feather discussion or anybody who joined is free to add things to the agenda, uh, even late, like at the start of the meeting. And I'll drop a second link to that agenda notes document in the chat. Um, before we formally started, somebody here um, brought up a question for the group as to the actual roles and background of the people participating in the call. So I'll invite you to go and uh, now that we're officially started and recorded, why don't you go put that question on the table again and we'll see what we get. Yeah, thanks Steve. Uh, so this stems from a very simple uh, logic that what what is generally the profile for someone who's working on and on it within the edge native space is it a purely someone who's purely development a development engineer a software engineer or is it a mishmash of a lot of devops things as or well as, uh, maybe an operations engineer or even some bits of industrial engineering comes into play because uh, it might be quite interesting to see how this uh, edge native landscape pans out through different sectors these days so uh, so in general, I say I could start from myself. I generally am more into uh, software architecture most of the times. Uh, that also leads to a lot of, uh, um, I would say, more or less system operations because a lot of tools that are being used in the industrial IoT space are much more, let's say, low code or no code. So it's very rare that you get to write code these days because everything is pretty much standardized from the operations technology. So I would claim myself to be much more of a sysops as opposed to a DevOps or a pure software engineer in this space. How about if we just go around the table and poll people for whatever it's worth? And if you feel that you're just a lurker and not prepared to answer, you can abstain, but I'm just gonna go in the list of what shows up on my participants list. So Brandon, do you want to throw something in there, either your personal experience or what you have observed as a vendor or somebody in the field? Uh, sure. So I'm Brandon Wick. I head up marketing for Arna Networks. We're a uh, software startup in the uh, edge orchestration and 5G space. And our interest and in participation is just because we see uh, a tremendous amount of growth and development uh, with the edge and edge infrastructure. And we want to be uh, leading uh, contributors and participants in that. We have a team of uh, software engineers, uh, architects, and developers um, that follow this group kind of through me. So I'm kind of acting as a bridge between those uh, between as representative of the company and um, the CNCF community. And uh, it's also, I think, just in our interest to produce documents uh, like we're working on now that establishes baselines uh, for the industry around important concepts like uh, cloud native. So sort of a project manager here and help facilitate uh, the development. But as a longtime open source um, community participant, definitely uh, see that uh, communities thrive best when there is a diversity of uh, different types of uh, roles and uh, and of uh, companies uh, in the ecosystem that all sort of get a voice. So one of the things I like about this group is that um, you know we, we tend to you know take in a lot of different uh, perspectives and it's it's very community driven in terms of where we want to go. 
Uh, Dan, do you want to go next? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I consider myself a software engineer, right? <laughs> but uh, lo looking at, at Red Hat as an organization, I see, yeah, mostly software engineers and, and people uh, already involved in, into all kind of uh, infrastructure engineering. So working on, on RHEL and, and OpenShift, uh, mostly uh, involved into this. I'm also, uh, as I'm coming from like a middleware side of things, also in interested in uh, in the, like uh, event-driven architectures and, and generally application architectures related to, to Edge and, and, and what new type of architectures and paradigms we need to, to solve some of those challenges. So, yeah. Uh, next, uh, how about you, Joel? I think you're hey. muted. There you go. I was, I was, I was juggling mute buttons as we do. Uh, so Joel Roberts, I'm an architect within Cisco Systems. Um, big proponent of open source. Uh, my, I'm in a post sales or customer experience part of uh, Cisco. Uh, so my focus day to day with customers is predominantly. Uh, I guess what we call DevOps or infrastructure uh, up to being a sysadmin for the compute that gets to the actual application. Um, so I'd say DevOps, infrastructure, and connectivity. Um, previously, I was a software engineer. Um, so I have that experience, but day to day, I'm more focused on the connectivity, um, application networking, and DevOps. Okay, hey, George, I haven't seen you in a long time, but uh, why don't you go ahead and since I think you're have either new to this group or haven't been active for a while, introduce yourself as well. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm George Castro. I recently joined the CNCF as a developer advocate and I am literally going to every tag meeting this week uh, to meet people, see what groups people are doing and uh kind of be available for projects and things like that it's literally my third day <laughs> so uh i'm mostly just here to learn and, and listen to see what what people are into and see how i can help so okay george uh, fyi that that i i'm sure you can read it from the charters but as you know with your past experience in kubernetes and cncf sometimes these groups drift a little bit from the official dis description and oh yeah it's pretty much charged it, historically it started as the cnc or the kubernetes iot edge working group mm -hmm. and it was people trying to address edge use cases which can be all over the map as we're discussing yeah. now uh with kubernetes it kind of morphed to where the observation was that people were starting to conclude that in many of these edge cases, maybe Kubernetes wasn't the best or most appropriate tool, or mm -hmm. it was a collateral thing with mostly other things being the things that were more worthy of being talked about and discussed and evaluated. And it's mm -hmm. kind of, oh, because it had that more open-ended nature, it transitioned to the CNCF where right. we're free to talk about even pretty much any open source project in the CNCF landscape, as well as LF Edge projects, Eclipse Foundation projects. The sure, sure. rule here is that we don't want it to be commercial promos, but if it's open source, it's fair game if, if mm -hmm. it applies at the edge. So that's what we're aspiring to be about here. Awesome. Um, well, I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. Okay. Next, uh, uh, Julio, I, maybe I'm, that's not how you pronounce it. If so, correct me, but. Um... No, that's, that's actually right. So my name is Julio Armenta. I am a, I'm not a developer. I'm a telecommunications engineer. I, uh, I am an architect for Dish Wireless. And uh, my role is I'm responsible for the design of the virtualization and Kubernetes platforms for the, uh, 5G network that uh, we are deploying. Uh, so we have a very specific edge use case, which is basically deployment of the radio network. Um, uh, so we are using uh, Kubernetes as the platform for our, uh, you know, radio uh, applications. 
So it's a very specific edge use case. And uh, I'm, I'm here to share knowledge and experience and also to learn from the group and uh, what is the new, new te newer technologies that is gonna help us uh, do a better job at the edge. Uh, that's basically my, my role. Okay, sounds great. And by the way, Shan, I'm kind of moderating, but feel free to jump in if you have follow-up questions for anybody, just oh, say whatever. Um, next, I've got uh, Liam. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Liam Randall. I work on uh, WebAssembly, uh, specifically CNCF Wasm file, uh, which are actually in the process of, of submitting to incubating. Um, I created one of the first Kubernetes companies in 2014, um, and I really, uh, all of my um, you know, work has been around open core since the uh, 90s, uh, open sourcing stuff for Novell 312 networks. Um, and I really uh, work on the Better Together story with Kubernetes and WebAssembly. Um, smaller, uh, lighter functions on on the edge. I'm also the chair of CNCF WASM Day, uh, co-located with KubeCon, and I'm on the program committee for WASMCon, which we just announced. Okay, thanks. Um, through my name list here, Philip. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, Philip Griffiths, I look after... Um, outbound product and evangelism for NetFoundry, company behind OpenZT, which allows us to apply zero trust networking to basically any use case uh, being open source, whether it's edge, IoT, you know, multi-cloud, et cetera. So we can completely abstract away complexity of underlying networks and not have to worry about you know, public DNS, VPNs, inbound ports, et cetera. Uh, my interest is uh, actually uh, working on iteration three of the white paper and how we can apply zero trust networking concepts to edge native environments in the same way that we are at the moment with uh, EdgeX, which is one of the large projects within the, the uh, LF Edge, so Linux Foundation for the Edge. Um, yeah, that's me. Um, Prakash, how about, how about if you introduce yourself and go next? Okay. Hi everyone, uh, Prakash here. I am at uh, San Francisco area, Bay Area, and uh, I am part of the uh, IEEE Edge Working Group co-chair, and uh, I have been in the Edge uh, for almost a dozen years now, and uh, currently I am uh, uh, co-founder and uh, for. Emerging Open Tech Foundation out of Mumbai, India, and stay here in uh, Bay Area in Silicon Valley. So we also am part of the CCICI Cloud Council of India, where uh, we had a zero trust uh, security for the cloud. And uh, so conversant with a lot of areas, I also contributed earlier and uh, verified the uh, many of the Linux Foundation as well as the OpenStack and various places. So at this time, I'm just coming back after a long time, so I don't know what was happening here. So apology for that. I just try to review what is going on. And hopefully if I can be of any help to the organization. Thank you. Okay, that sounds good. Prashant, how about if you go next? Uh, yeah, so hi everyone. So I'm uh, the guy who worked on Edge uh, with the uh, Neota project there was from VMware and Pearl Sarity. Uh, so I basically work as a software engineer. Uh, currently, I'm a bit, uh, I've not worked recently on the edge groups and also joined the group to because it's an interest platform for me, uh, IoT Edge. Uh, so that's why I joined the group to follow along and learn from you all guys and also contribute to wherever required. So thanks. Everyone. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Rob, how about you? Sure, it's my pleasure. My name is Rob Woolley. I work in the CTO office at Wind River. Um, some of the things that I do involve a lot of PowerPoint slides, but also doing technical proof of concepts. So that could involve using small microcontrollers with Zephyr and other RTOSs to, and using Kubernetes to orchestrate workloads to those microcontrollers. It also involves like uh, using containers with RTOSs and Linux on robots, as well as trying to figure out how to use Kubernetes 
in the 5G telecommunications use case with things like Starling X. So everything from microcontrollers to large uh, Kubernetes instances at the near edge. Uh, okay, and finally, I think I, the last one is Victor. I'm Victor Liu. I'm a, actually a database consultant for 20 plus years. So um, I've been actively in the open source community for the past several months. Um, one area I'm focusing is security. Um, however, I believe um, the, the I'm interested in edge because just uh, there's a lot of things going on in edge. Uh, and I believe edge is more of a, for me at least, it's kind of a more of a location of the application uh, instead of, a, you know, what do you do there? So um, before I jumped into database, I was actually a physicist in Fermi National Lab doing 100 particle physics. Uh, there we actually, whenever there's a, we, we actually work on every aspect from hardware, software, for uh, physics analysis. So to me, it's, uh, yeah, I guess I have the luxury of do not have to make a living on edge computing. So so that, that's for me, I'm, I'm trying to learn from the, every aspect of it and, uh, you know, whatever is interesting. Again, I think to me, it's, it's edge, it's a location and, and which, what is the location? I think that's, I'm still looking for an answer of what is edge computing when it comes to, you know, type of location. Okay, I guess I'll go there and I guess maybe I'll even uh, segue from your question, Victor, of what is edge. And this is just based on my observations working in the field that is self-described as edge. First of all, I work for VMware um, and I'm also, I've been a co-chair of this group for years. And prior to VMware, I worked for uh, what was then a startup. I was one of the founders of the company Wonderware that did a toolkit for industrial automation, originally mainly uh, user interface stuff, but it morphed and did acquisitions getting into uh, control, historical data logging and you name it. Um, my observation of Edge is that it's always been a conflicted self-description of some of them determine it by location, some of it, lo the location is based on physical location, some based on network latencies and connectivity. There are some definitions that to declare it to be a space with low resource. And I think the common thing is it's stuff not running in a public cloud. I think that there's pretty much universal agreement that that description would apply to Edge, that it's not running in a public cloud. But at that point, and it probably also isn't the mezzanine level, if you got a big enough organization that you're running tiers, it's sort of the stuff that network wise is out on leaf nodes. And beyond that, no one's ever really came come up with a universal description. If anything, it's forked into things like, you know, device edge, retail edge. And I think that kind of forking is fair because people in these different categories have, um, different priorities of what's important to them. In terms of Shan's original question of who, what is typical of the players, I think, you know, whether they be actual hands-on software engineers or more ops people, I think it varies dramatically by use case in my observation. And from a project perspective, I've over decades seen a lot of organizations that really rely on outside vendors or uh, you know, whether they be shrink wrap software vendors or consulting firms to do kind of the initial architecture and planning design or at least contribute to it because those are short-term roles and often the life cycle of these things is measured in decades. So that and, unless they're a really large organization that's continually deploying a growing number of edge outposts that's a short-term need and they choose to outsource it. So they don't necessarily have people permanently on staff to do some of these roles. And over time, um, you know, they have internal people who operate these things, but they weren't necessarily the ones who uh, did the original planning. And organizations that point to the extent possible often try to rely on I'll call them shrink wrap solutions, um, but shrink wrap solutions are tough in this field because every edge thing tends to be a little different. 
so that you do need somebody to get involved with those kind of customization aspects. And in terms of what percentage is custom versus done by your off the shelf stuff, sometimes the custom part is 10 times the size in terms of engineering hours involved of what you were able to get from shrink wrap. Um, anyway, I'll, some, let's see, somebody raised their hand. Yes, my again, like, yeah. So yeah, I still, uh, so, so um, to me, it's still, a, it's a location that I like, like to understand it. For example, um, if you're in an AWS data center, you know, you, you, even within that data center, but you're using 5G technology, that's probably still considered edge, right? Mm -hmm. So in the other hand, if you're having a full power cloud data center on the moon or Mars, isn't that, that also edge computing? Yeah. I, when I said cloud, I said public cloud, meaning you know, like you rent it. You know, there, there is an aspect, it, arguably, if it, you can put it out a cluster of servers, maybe as small as three, uh, you know, three Intel nooks and turn them into a Kubernetes cluster. And that is a cloud. So I specifically put the adage public cloud there as so opposed say, to cloud. If AWS build a data center on the moon, is that edge? Um, I don't know. Yes. So, so let me let me take this one. Uh, it just uh, depends on the priority of what you are getting out of the edge. If you are talking about IoT, that's one thing. IoT can happen for weather bureaus also. It's not necessarily that it is uh, private. It can be public also. So I don't think that uh, it's just private. Uh, edge. It depends on, so some of the priorities of some of the applications are latencies. And if the latency is the criteria, then closer to the user, that is the definition for edge for those priorities. And um, other definitions are like example, if I have a car and I have automated auto, driving, that's an edge, it's a moving edge. Same way we can have a satellite and if you are having a, uh, what you call, uh, satellite moving and then you are trying to have something related to satellite for communication terrestrial to satellite that might be edge for them for drones etc drones are even high performance you call it as uh, aviation uh, uh, vehicles and all that so it's edge is very relative term and for iot of course we try to have a gateway but there is no need for a gateway it can be direct also edge is uh, all pervading you can define as you want there is no uh, as long as you know what is the use case we can say this is the edge or not the edge in automation automated driving of course automation you want that car is the edge the onboard car has got its own uh, uh, processing to take care of uh, directions uh, making sure that it is uh, vehicle is able to uh, even you can have vehicle to vehicle so I don't think that we should be bothered too much about the age definition. It's the use case that drives it. And depending on, if you are a, a telco guy, you will always want provider edge. If you are an IIT guy, you always want a IoT edge. If you are doing AI, ML and all GPT chats and chat GPTs and all that, then you want something so that you can offload your uh, work from edge to the cloud so that the computation is reduced at the, uh, so, there is no such thing as uh, you have to define edge. You can go by use cases, whatever the use cases, if you find that that improves whatever your criteria is, based on that, you can define the edge. Now, then the question is, what is the difference between edge and cloud? There are models, cloud can control the edge, edge can be self, uh, uh, self-managed, uh, it can be part of the cloud or, so there are many, many models, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, different ways of looking at it. But if, since we, I think this was, we are dealing with IoT, I would stick to that IoT is a gateway at the edge. Yeah, thank you. I hope I have made my point. The yeah, skill set for, depend on the type of uh, location, the skill set will be quite different though, right? Just like you said, if you, de if you develop application for IoT or for uh, automobile, um, it's quite different for someone building a data center on the moon, right? Because that that is totally different skill set. Yeah, Dan, you have your hand raised. 
Yeah, yeah. In my opinion, this uh, uh, example of uh, the you know cloud on the moon to me it would be more multi-cloud or hybrid hybrid cloud use case than than the edge. Uh, I see that edge needs to have some core cloud uh, in, in 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 that matter. So that is. Uh, yeah, distinction is 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 a is, is a little bit uh, blurry, but uh, my opinion, edge is is the edge of the cloud. So so there needs to be something, yeah, that, that's, that's core cloud in this use case. I I would I would say that when you say multi cloud, it means you are talking of the two sides of the similar cloud. If I have OpenStack at one end, OpenStack at another, that is multi cloud. But when you say hybrid cloud, one may be OpenStack, other may be Amazon AWS, or it could be some Azure. So if you look with respect to cloud, multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, have, they are the cloud. But when you talk about the edge, edge can be any of the uh, any of these uh, operating uh, cloud operating systems. So edge doesn't uh, is not determined by either hybrid cloud or uh, multi-cloud. It's a computational uh, computational data center type of place connected with the network to some either peer to peer or uh, whatever models you use with cloud or with not with cloud cell it is a smaller place a smaller computational uh, unit which allows the uh, application or the users to be enabled for the criteria they are uh, looking for. So it's not necessarily the uh, big data center, hyperscale data centers where you have got hundred thousands of uh, device, uh, compute uh, servers, rather a small, uh, generally we say it is small means it can be half a server, one server to 10 server type of capability. That is what we call as edge by any definition. So. And, and IoT is too small for that. IoT, even, we don't even go to that level. We just say it is aggregation point whereby you are able to deliver these services of the IoT at the edge. Okay, I'm gonna call this to a close both because on the agenda, we've got another item to cover, but also because I think we, we've had these discussions before in this group and many other groups. I've given some references in chat to externals, but my, in my opinion, the bottom line is that really nobody in the history of the world has come up with a one sentence description of what is edge. It's just, uh, they've narrowed it down, but there are categories and subcategories and maybe we'll leave it at that for now. Um, Brandon, do you want to go and be host of the, the um, yeah. white paper yeah. draft discussion? Yeah, I'll leave it to you good. whether you I've already posted a link to it, but if you want to share it to uh, for people who might be challenged opening the sure. link for whatever reason, go ahead. Yeah, I'd welcome you to open the doc in the chat uh, to have it as a reference and I'll also uh, share my screen. Uh, so uh, a couple of the authors uh, couldn't make it today. I think we're missing uh, Frank and her. Uh, we do have uh, Andy and Joel here. So uh, we went through this paper on the, the previous call. Uh, we've now touched on it a couple of times. I think our goal here is to try to uh, bring this to uh, completion and to uh, finalize this draft uh, for now. We can leave some time you know, after we round up here for any uh, final um, uh, edits or uh, comments uh, from the group, but we're trying to bring this to a close here soon so we can move this into the design phase. There are a couple of comments outstanding. Um, we can talk through those, but first, I think we want to talk about what has changed from the last version uh, that we went through. And I think uh, uh, at least Joel has made uh, an uh, contribution around uh, diagram. So Joel, do you want to maybe start and then we can uh, go to Andy?
might be stuck on mute. Leave Sorry about that. Oh. Can you hear me now? You just yes. Yeah. Talking? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, if you stay right here for a moment, Brandon, uh, what I've done is this section here uh, almost gets into deployment scenarios. Um, so at the at the end, I've taken there. There's the table that gets into uh, tiers and layers. Um, so now, Brandon, if you go down to the bottom, I've simply added diagrams that are additional slides in the edge native sketches. Um, that does a visualization of what those tiers are. Uh, just back up a little. Further up, there's a bold text that says deployment scenarios. There right go. there. So that right there was, um, so this, this could be uh, earlier in the document. This could go at the end, uh, or we could choose not to use it. Um, depends on, you know, there, there could be an element of scope creep here based on the spirit of behaviors for this document. Uh, but this, I reinserted the, uh, for the previous discussion or for the purpose of this paper in this discussion, I added the Linux Foundation, um, I forget the name of it. It's out of the LF Edge white paper that we did in the previous IoT Edge paper that reiterates for the purpose of this discussion, here is the user edge SP centralized data center. Um, I And if you can scroll down a little, Brandon, please, uh, just reinserted the material that was above and then below that, keep going down, there's a diagram of the sample application that simply shows, hey, you have an exceptionally constrained device of a camera, a smart device or on-prem edge uh, with a sample app and then a centralized data center. Um, so that's how that sample application maps to those definitions. And then if you go down further, the progression here is, here's a single tier. It could be a standalone app on an edge device. Um, and then it just builds from there. There's an example of a single tier or single layer. Uh, when you go down further, uh, that just builds to, okay, you have a single edge, but the intent is you're gonna have tens, hundreds or many, and then that's a two tier or two layer that was in that table. And then below that is a uh, three tier, uh, which generally, if you're gonna scale large enough, you may need to have an SP edge or an intermediary uh, to be able to support that. But Andy, and I think we have Andy on, that's what we had talked about talking about before and so far as a visualization um i didn't put a lot of content or description of that because i don't know if that goes into a follow-on paper or do we want to add that here yeah uh, thanks for um uh, adding this in here joel so i think you're right. I think in terms of the scope of the paper as is, I mean, I, I think alluding to the idea that there could be intermediary uh, or more than just hub and spoke uh, and, and introducing the idea of a hierarchy here might be useful, but not necessarily giving any more of the, the details necessarily other than to say that it could be an option. I think I think it does probably fall outside the scope here because it can start to bring in other, I think, ramifications and other concerns like things like how to secure the uh, and make sure that the multi tenancy and the isolation of the workloads, et cetera, are are insured. So I think a lot of those kinds of 
larger concerns start to creep in once you start talking about more than just hub and scope. This is more of a, I think this, for what it's worth and it being an edge native principles or application best best practices, how to design and implement one. I think this is good the way it is now, you know, without getting too much further into the details of, of what it would be like to introduce more than just hub and spoke, but that's just my opinion. Andy, can I ask if you think it's more appropriate to list these diagrams um, sort of at the bottom as it is sort of an appendix as it is or up in the body text? Um, are they too long? Do they maybe would it break up the flow? Should we keep them down here separately? Yeah, I'm looking at the at at it online and oh, it just flashed away. How did that happen? Zoom is taking over control of my desktop here. Okay, yeah, I'm looking at these that are more towards the bottom. I think we we got it past that VCAT. The VCAT probably is the last scenario that that one there that has the. Mm -hmm. uh, the camera and the relation between the two gray boxes, but then also has the mapping back to the prior papers terminology, user edge, service provider edge. When we started to get into the tiering, that probably could be appendix uh, appendix material right here. Yeah. Got it. So, hey, Andy, I agree with that one thought. Um, it could be a next white paper yeah. of edge deployment options. And I yep. think it was Liam in the last meeting was had the diagrams of, um, hey, here's user SP centralized data center. And he had diagrams that should, hey, here's where Kubernetes sits. Here's right. where uh, K3S, here's yeah. Wasm. I think that would be great. You know, it's like we could, we could end it at the sample app and then just go right into that's one edge deployment scenarios. And then the other paper that you alluded to is uh, Zero Trust Edge. That Philip mm -hmm. had mentioned, but I think Philip had to drop. The only thing I would say, Andy, potentially as a suggestion is take that um, on the bottom there, the uh, LF uh, Edge Continuum, I think is the title in the original paper. If we just inserted that where you had, hey, here are considerations, Hey, here's the LF edge definition. Um, here mm -hmm. are considerations, here are tiers, and just keep it as simple as that. Yeah. But that's yeah. just a suggestion. I'm now thinking out loud. No, I think that's right. I think you're showing how the deployment uh, maps on top of the uh, of the suggested, you know, how so you're giving, you know, when you if, uh, if we scroll up a little bit here, you're giving out, you know, what are the how did the principles map into a, a subscribed architecture and then you make it a little bit i think uh you connect it back to what the terminology was where this was already linked to from the previous paper and i think that that leaves mm -hmm. that gives the the reader uh the connective tissue that they need to say you know this is uh, a coordinated effort from the the iot edge community and that the the documents align and that this is a natural extension I think going any further than that, right, starts to bleed into, you know, new territory and something we would have to spend more time linking it back. So I tend to agree that I think that once you get done with that last diagram on the LF edge, the next, the, 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 the tiering discussions, single, multi, et cetera, start to get into new territory. And uh, I think they, they add a bit more cognitive load on the audience than is necessary at this stage. So I think it's cleaner if we break like you're suggesting. We've got a couple hands raised, so I, I wasn't paying attention yeah. enough to know which one of you raised uh, first. Uh, how okay. about you, Sean? Sean? Yeah, um, um, Brendan and Andy, I was just curious about the, the specification of the word volume. Would it is it very specific to the like some of the tools that we use? I mean. On the other hand, you have something like a persistent storage service. What what difference would it make when you have a mention of volumes in the diagram? And as far as I just did a quick search, there's only one mention of what a volume is over here. Is it something that has a certain retention policies that gets cleaned up after a certain amount of time or something? Or is that yeah, uh, if you something that we could describe it well? 
Yeah, if you look up a little further in the principles, and I'm just mm -hmm. scrolling to, 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 there is a discussion point about data storage, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, the, the, the addition of either the, uh, having, if you have constraints on the size of, of whatever the volume is in this mm -hmm. case. So I guess you could say volume is interchangeable with data storage and, and mm -hmm. uh, the size of the volume makes a difference as to, you know, whether metrics or logs will be kept locally, whether they'll be rotated on some regular cadence, or they'll be, you know, if they can't be shipped off and, and, and removed entirely. Same is true for things like considerations for bandwidth, caching or buffering, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So the idea of having the volume uh, uh, located inside of the smart device edge is the is just to give you the play that it could be if we have it on the edge, you have considerations that have to be taken into account. And if you'd rather than be on the cloud and a persistent mm -hmm. a persistent storage device, then there are, you know, and you're not going to use a volume locally, then there's other ramifications for that, right? So you have you can't have you have to have constant connectivity. So if we're talking about things like edge devices that can't always have connectivity, they have to do some degree of store and forward. And so store and forward then begs the question, well, where is that being stored before it's forward? Yeah, can I suggest maybe in that diagram, I, I think it's a perfectly valid point that volume's not defined. Uh, yeah. For context, Kubernetes, happens to use the term volumes for what they yeah. call persistent or volume even non-persistent volumes. But yeah. I think we maybe want to be more open here in that these solutions at the edge nodes might be Kubernetes, but perhaps not. So labeling that storage, would that be? Yeah, either uh, maybe storage a better or, description? or probably ephemeral storage. Well, it could be ephemeral or not, I think. Mm -hmm. So whether, I think I still have a comment there on uh, the storage section that Andy mentioned that I don't feel is fully resolved yet uh, as to whether this is a blanket prohibition on uh, use of persistent storage at the edge node or not. Um, but anyway, I think storage, there should be no debate on that's appropriate in the diagram. And whether you choose to call out that that storage happens to be a cache only or not, uh, I think is something, an issue still on the table. How about labeling it something like application specific storage? So depending on how you, if, if it's a buffer, if it's a cache, if it has retentions, if it has, if it's meant to be persistent too, like there can be cases where people would love to have things persisted on the edge itself. Maybe some edge devices might be we are capable enough to have a terabyte disk, I don't know, or NVMe stuff on it. So just a suggestion, maybe. Yeah, we, uh, we tended to stay away from persistence on the edge, but go ahead. Yeah, right. Grant. This is Liam. I, I think the instinct um, to take all the implementation details and specific attributes out of the discussion is the right one. Um, we face this issue um, in WebAssembly, for example, um, uh, the take like Blob Store, for example. There are many different implementations of a blob store, whether it's a physical um, disk, whether it's S3 or something along those lines. And to the to the various points shared around the room, those could be spooled to physical disk, spooled to memory. Um, the implementation details um, really don't uh, particularly matter. And I think it makes the, the diagram and definitions, it waters them down if you try to pin them to a specific type at this point. I think we wanna pull them up really high um, to some sort of generally accepted definition, like a, like a blob store or just um, a, a loose definition of a volume to allow specific implementations to, to fall in. Uh, the second thing I was going to mention is, is yes, the I did show the graphic last week. We made some edits to it based on the feedback we got. We pulled the Kubernetes down a little bit. I'll, I'll talk to my graphics person and I'll share that in the um, in the shared Slack channel. I apologize, I'm mobile today. I'm about to hop on a flight to Ireland. And then the the third um, item I just wanted to touch on was on the zero trust piece. I agree that's super interesting. It's probably a separate full topic. Capital One just did an awesome talk um, on zero trust microservices where they did zero trust networking plus zero trust um, uh, microservices in web, in web assembly. Super interesting stuff. Jordan Rash just gave that talk. Um, uh, if you're interested in that space, uh, strong recommend on, uh, on watching it. Thank you, Liam.
Julio, I think you have your hand raised too. Yes, yeah, sorry. I just want to share my our experience on on chair storage, or share PV at the edge. Yeah, it, it is a, a quite a challenge because it's very hard to have a storage solution with low overhead. It ends up that to have shared storage, shared PV requires a massive amount of resources just to have the storage solution at the edge. So that I agree with the comments on addressing that is a, it's a major uh, challenge. Uh, I don't know if that needs to be mentioned or needs to be addressed in a different document. Yeah, I think I added a note in the chat too, saying that this this goes all the way back to early days of Docker. And I actually loved a comment somebody made on Twitter saying stateless is a fraud. And it was a comment on the, the 12 factors adage saying that all applications should be stateless. And it's an observation that declaring that all apps are stateless isn't real. You have to have state somewhere. And what you're doing is just saying, I'm going to throw the hard parts over the fence to somebody else, and they don't go away. Now, you could come up with a, you know, a, a blanket statement saying that when you run at edge, you're not allowed to have any state at edge. But I personally think that in many cases, Julio is right, and it's really hard to have reliable persistent storage at edge. But in some cases, you have no choice. I mean, if if you are faced with an application that has data sovereignty regulations saying that this information isn't allowed to leave this site, uh, you've got to deal with it. And you yeah. might be in a situation where you have to deal with persistent storage and edge. So I don't think that it's fair to make a statement that it's outright banned. No, I, well, I so Steve, we get into like some interesting spaces and conversations when it when it comes to persistence and non-persistence at the edge. I, I can't say that there's got to be fiat, right? But but at the same time, what I would say is this, is that mo when we're talking about, I have to wear two hats when we talk about this. The first is, is if I want the truest sense of what an edge is as defined by the IoT working group, and uh, by others around, right? When we say the word edge, it triggers people to think of constraints. Mm -hmm. And so there's not really a lot in terms of flexibility when it comes to, you know, how much storage am I gonna, am I gonna leave on this device and how much connectivity, it, there's, there's a lot of constraints around that. So if we think in through those parameters and through that lens, then it's reasonable to think that, and this is the reason why the tiering was introduced in this document, but yet not fully explained, if you have another tier for which you can offload some of that responsibility, the one of the, we believe one of the best practices is to do so, right? Yeah. Is to is to give it to an, it doesn't have to be the hub. It can be an intermediary that exists just north, let's just say, uh, with, without getting too specific on proximity, north of of what that edge device is that is responsible for things like storage or other or other functions that can right. be executed. Yeah. So it. It's not edge, but it's intermediary. It's a service provider of some sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree certainly that if you've got it and the options available, that generally if you don't have constraints on bandwidth and it'll work for you, fine, you should use it. But I think that there's also situations where that won't be an option. So that uh, you saying that you would recommend it or provide features that, Supported is fine, but you know, going as far as the twelve factors of all applications shall be stateless. I think no, I, I think, I think you're right. I think we can back away from there being fiat. I totally agree with you there. I, I just think it's it's um, you're you're right in 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 the way you're softening the approach. And I think there's like even a continuum where you've got the storage north of the edge node where. You could have it be a caching situation that attempts to be uh, one for one, sort of a stretch sort storage sh scenario where, uh, you know, well, you know, on this continuum, there could be one that's synchronous, where if mm -hmm. you've had transaction like processing, the actual write isn't confirmed until you know for a fact that you have made a duplicate copy uh, north of your edge node. 
and it's guaranteed to come back should you suffer outages or failures at the edge site. Uh, another one is kind of best efforts where you've kind of put it in a pipe to be replicated elsewhere, but it's subject to loss and kind of the bottom of that where you're trying to do your best best one might be something like you have storage at edge, but you do daily backups on a 24 hour basis. If you lose that edge, well, you might have lost any data recorded in the last day, but you didn't lose everything and it's better than nothing. And yeah, I'm reminded, I'm rem as you're talking, I'm reminded and I get twitches, right? And nightmares about these types of things where my, my uh, file system is full and I can't do anything anymore, right? I can't, I can't start up, uh, I can't execute applications. I can't make uh, changes to the operating system or the system configuration. I get all kinds of restraints and, and there's nothing that alarms me immediately that says, hey, it's because your, your file system's full, dummy. So mm -hmm. the thing is, is that, you know, when we talk about small devices, we want to kind of stay away from there being this, uh, you know, hey, you could be anything you want. We want to kind of give some recommendation here. So, but I agree that it shouldn't be as strict as we might be projecting it right now. I see hands up, so I wanted to defer. Julio is next. No, I think I already spoke. Sorry, I just need to lower no, no, my hand. I, I think this discussion is exactly why we can't be too prescriptive. Um, and I think we did an awesome job, but I think uh, maybe if we took the other approach and we, instead of talking about the implementation details um, or uh, uh, that would show up in a particular solution, if we talked about some of the requirements on the front side, it would help, I think, to make room for lots of different implementations. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If we called out instead, um, uh, some of the um, edge requirements that may show up, like, um, for example, limited and deliberate autonomy, um, privacy, uh, security, um, uh, performance constraints, and so forth, we could essentially, uh, and that's me, that's my, me with all the pains, I apologize. Um, uh, uh, we could, I think, make um, room uh, for um, uh, lots of, of different implementations to show up downstream and still give people the, you know, to give the understanding that, hey, we understand that, you know, for a satellite that's intermittently connected around um, the earth or uh, a driverless car that is sometimes disconnected from the internet, there are all sorts of requirements. So let's just talk about some of the requirements that may show up. I apologize. I get a Slack message whenever someone logs into our product. So they've just got uh, people, a ton of people logging in right now. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for that. Um, so I think you're saying if we introduce something a little earlier in the paper, talking about uh, these potential requirements on the front side, list them out, doesn't have to be an exclusive list. But then when we uh, introduce these uh, sections later on, it sets the stage for a little bit of flexibility. And we can probably um, change the name or change the language here. Right now, it does sound dictatorial, data only, so something like can be data only, or um, we can review the language in this whole section to uh, accommodate that feedback. Sounds good. Okay. Well, I, th I think we're nearly out of time. Anyone else have any other quick comments? Well, let me throw a little bit more color on that storage. Uh, okay. On the storage thing. I hate this maybe already is already out of control, but I think it's important to realize that this storage goes into multiple categories too. There's the storage used by your app. You know, if you write an application and it tries to use, I don't know, database or whatever, that that's an implementation detail but your app store might have persistent storage needs and you might aspire to keep that in a cloud or need to keep it local. But in addition to that, the control plane itself, if you use Kubernetes, that might be the etcd backing store becomes an issue. And there's things kind of in a gray area, like uh, depending on your techniques of app deployment, you might get involved with GitOps and have a Git repo you likely have a container image registry, uh, maybe a Helm chart registry. If the edge node needs to be autonomous, meaning that it can boot up when the upbound connection is severed, you, you're going to have effectively 
a local registry in order to pull that off potentially. Now, maybe that gets replicated so that that registry that's local at the edge node is really a cache, but you, you should make a conscious decision of that. And likewise, if you're using GitOps, you might have kind of a, a local Git repo that is being replicated from an upstream one in the cloud, but really you have to, the architect of your implementation had better plan out all of the repercussions of what decisions you make because there's state involved with all of these. Yeah, Prakash, I would like to say that um, private cloud and even virtual private cloud is a cloud, private cloud, even though it may be hosted on a uh, public cloud. So I don't think you should put an on-prem there, just leave it as private cloud uh, in the table there. So I, I think there's a lot, I mean, the reason there, there's so many different use cases and slash locations, sometimes it's really hard to generalize at this point. Uh, for the, my understanding, for example, the how um, web, sem, web assembly applications in orchestrate right now is not by, by, by uh, Kubernetes, right, the orchestrator. But I believe there was work being done to actually change that. So yeah, so there's a lot of things that's still evolving and, and, and it's hard to generalize in a lot of areas. Yeah, true, that's true. But at the same time, we are only focused on the VCAT uh, application, right? So there is a uh, transformation involved and the transformation uh, may be very compute intensive. So that is why we may have to move it out of the edge to any place. Otherwise, if it was as simple as uh, just capturing the image and uh, uh, applying it, that's a different story. Here, uh, you need sometimes image recognition, you need sometimes uh, some other transformation. So that is one of the main reasons that uh, we have to offload some of the work and that could be beyond the edge. And if it is everything, it can be done at the edge. Like if you have something like uh, what they call as image processing, there is one more, uh, I, right, I'm forgetting that name, ONNI or something, which is you can, uh, for a machine learning and all, you can process, use those models to uh, do runtime there itself with a reduced uh, uh, load, workload for that, then it is possible. Anyway, hey, it's, Rob, it's complex, it's complex, I'll leave it at this, thank you. Okay. Rob, you've got your hand up and we'll make you the last uh, comment here because we're nearing our time. Uh, thanks. I think one of the challenges here is the at, on the diagram where we define what is edge and what is cloud, we have a whole list of constraints that people have to consider. And I don't think people are going to have all constraints in all use cases. So uh, people are going to make trade-offs and they're going to put more storage at the edge in order to overcome the problems with bandwidth and latency. Um, so what I would suggest is instead of having a single example that tries to embody all of the constraints and the trade-offs people might make, maybe it would be good to have two or three examples that demonstrate that not all the constraints apply in all use cases. Yeah, I like that idea. Anyway, we, we are at the top of the hour, Brandon, I think you're driving this with others. So I'll leave you to, we can continue on asynchronously using the comments in yep. that doc. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with Rob's last comment myself that it, that's an interesting perspective that in some ways allocating more resource to storage is perhaps a valid trade-off for having connectivity constraints. Uh, Stephen, to help the folks, the authors who weren't here today understand the discussion, could you share with us the recording? Yeah, I can. I'll, I'll get it up in the next 24 hours. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for attending, um, and we'll see you at the next meeting. Bye.